last chapter for chap exam four, chapter 25, and this is on optical instruments. Right, and we'll be talking about here today our concepts related to that. So, um, the first question here, which you can think about, is make a magnifying glass. And the question they have here is, um, how much can you, what's about the maximum you can magnify uh, light with using a light microscope? Uh, would it be 50 times, 100 times, 500 times, 2,000 times, or 5,000 times? And then the smallest object that you could have, would it be about 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers, 500 nanometers, 25 or 5,500 nanometers? So what's about the smallest object you could see with a regular microscope using light, right? Because we talked about in the previous chapter, and switch pens, Light is a wave, and based on that, there is diffraction. And the diffraction is related to the wavelength of the light. Now light, a visible light, has a spectrum between 400 nanometers and about 700 nanometers. So this is about the range as far as the smallest object you could possibly see with uh, that. Now again, a thousand nanometers is one micron, 10 to the minus sixth, right? So that's pretty small, but because of diffraction, we'll talk about diffraction that limits what you can see because remember from chapter 24, if we have a thin slit, the light, the light does not just pass through and form a shadow there, but it spreads out because of refraction. We have the same thing if we have a lens. A lens is a finite size to it. So there's always refraction related to that based on the wavelength of light. So we'll see later on, if you actually want to have, see very small objects like atoms and such, you need to go down to say like around x-rays. Um, which have a wavelength on the order of one nanometer or less. And then that's where you get into the electron microscope. Because if you want to be able to see small things, you have to be able to use the wavelengths that are associated with that. All right. So this is all part. This comes back from chapter 22. The X-rays are high energy, short wavelength. Visible where? So this is about the visible range as far as that's concerned. All right. So we move into. I'm not going to get into cameras at all. Uh, that's a beyond the scope here. It's an interesting part talking about the first section on chapter 25 on that. Um, I will get a little bit, let me talk a little bit about eye pieces, a uh, human eye, and corrective lenses. So, in that regards, human eye, right? You have the lens, cornea, 
and the parts that, that deal with that. I'll let you read the chapter on that on the human eye. All right. And how that all works and how the, the cornea can adjust the lens to be able to be able to see different objects. It actually changes the focal lens. So what we have here, um, normal, if we have a far object, it, the lens is such that it comes right there. If we have a cl much closer object, right, the light, the lens is going to have to become much thicker for it to focus closer up. So the lens is going to become thicker because the object, if you have an object here, uh, to be able to make it focus at the same part in the retina. So, now what happens here if we have somebody that is, say, nearsighted? Right? They can see near, but they can't see far away. So objects far away, in that case, instead of being focusing on the retina, will actually focus farther in. So far away objects will focus farther, um, will have more problems. But for somebody of nearsightedness, they will be able to see near, like me. I see. I can read fine, but I have a difficult time seeing things far away with my glasses. All right, um, so how do we correct for that? Well, since what it does is a tendency to the lens cannot thin itself out, what you have to actually do is spread the, let the light spread out longer. And in that case, you use a concave lens. In that case, it then allows the light to focus on the retina. So for nearsightedness, you use concave lenses. It's exactly what I have. I have a concave lens, thinner in the middle, fatter in the edges for that case. All right, now, what if you have somebody that is farsighted? Meaning they can see well farther away No problem seeing things far away accurately, but when it's something close, their eye is not able to focus its effect the mirror. So this is something like what happens to older people. They're uh, they the ability, the flexibility of lens changes so that they cannot accommodate the lens to be able to see up close. So that's when you need reading glasses or bifocals. So in this case, what a person needs who is farsighted is they need convex lens for reading. And that brings the light back farther up, right on the retina. So this is what you use for farsightedness as far as that's concerned all right so that's how it is for uh, that's concerned um, now the last thing is astigmatism and in that case uh, that's where the lens is not even symmetrical so there's one light in one part can be uh, focus one part and then on sideways so you have it's focuses a different direction so you actually have to make a special lens so that it can accommodate the eye as a certain focus based on the orientation of light so that's for astigmatism that's not going to be part of the test but that's part of what we're looking at
All right. Um, let's see. Oh, next thing I want to do is uh, talk about telescope. And a little bit on telescopes, so I can bring one in today. But a telescope, uh, simplest one is Galilean telescope. You have a lens. Um, F a certain focal object there, and then eyepiece FE, and this was, it was invented in 1609, uh, but Galileo was the first one to use uh, in 1609 to actually use a telescope to look at stellar objects, moon, Jupiter, moons of Jupiter, Saturn, and such as far as that's concerned. So, um, that's the simplest one is the refractor. Uh, then we have reflecting telescope, which was invented by Isaac Newton. And in that case, we have a mirror where the light comes in, it comes back out and then there's a middle mirror here that deflects the light to the eyepiece here. So this is a focal length of the eyepiece there. This will be the focal length of the object there. All right, so in this case, this is a reflector. Reflecting telescope. Um, basically, uh, this lens is the object here, mirror is the object. Now, the only thing we're going to be doing here for a telescope is you can adjust how big it can be uh, as far as what you can see based on the focal length, focal length of the, of the object. And the magnification is given by the focal length of the object lens divided by the focal length of the image lens. So, as an example, um, well, they got a telescope here. This is the famous <clears throat> Yerkes Telescope in Wisconsin. Um, it has a 40 inch divided divide, uh, lens. So, it has a, a lens of approximately that big. That it's the largest telescope refracting telescope ever made because beyond that it was almost impossible to make lenses that would work. This thing because it's so long on the picture I showed you I mean the telescope is uh, 20 meters wide. It's a high, the height of a seven-story building. So it has a focal length of 19 meters. Right? Now, with that, you use a very short eyepiece. Eyepieces have very sh um, short, and you can have an eyepiece, for this case, uh, would be FE, would be about 10 centimeters. It's actually quite big, and that would be 0.1 meters. So the magnification for this would be 190 times. So it would make things 190 times larger. Right, now you can change that as you want to put in different eyepieces. If you have a very small focal length, a very small eyepiece, and you get bigger magnification, of course, with bigger magnification, you have a much smaller, smaller field you're looking at. So if you're trying to find individual stars, you, you want sort of in-between sort of thing because you also have to deal with the atmosphere as far as that's concerned. Because the bigger the magnification, the more the atmospheric effects and blurring occur. 
So that's what we have there. Um, biggest telescope we have, um, the biggest reflecting telescope is 10 meters in diameter, right? And there's one the Europeans are building that is actually almost 40 meters in diameter, uh, the height of a 12 story building. So well, that's what we have there as far as telescopes are concerned. Now, as we move on here, um, yeah, like I said there's not a whole lot to this <clears throat> section here. Next section here, so that's uh, telescopes, and the main thing here is this part here. <clears throat> All right, next thing on telescopes, on, not telescopes, on lenses. Um, all right, is what we call aberrations. And there's two kinds of, of aberrations. Um, spherical aberration and that is the case where in a real lens, um, if you go more off, you know, more offline, right, then the light doesn't all focus in exactly the same spot. You know, they do the lens, the simple lens focus here, but in a real lens, it actually shifts somewhat in a real lens. Um, the bigger the lens, the harder it is for an object to focus at exactly one point. And this is what we call spherical aberration. Now to do that, to affect that, um, uh, this is where, like in a camera, you can have the focal length, you can have images up close, look sharp, but a little farther back, they're out of focus. You can change this by using f-stops. Now I'm not going to get it on a camera. And f-stops actually change the size of the lens that's actually working. If you have a very small lens, you can have a very long depth of field for focus. If you have a very large lens, it's very narrow as far as depth where you have actual focus. And that's spherical aberration. That occurs in a real lens. Um, the other one is what we call chromatic aberration. And that's because in real light, in a real lens, um, In a real lens, um, we have the Roy G. Viv, and this idea of dispersion is that the index refraction varies between red to violet. So what this means, chromatic aberration, is if I have real light going through a lens, the red will focus differently than the blue. And that's unavoidable in lenses. So what you have then to compensate for that is you have what they call achromatic doublets. And in that case, oh, I can just show that here with the textbook better than I can. And what you have in the top one is a normal typical lens. The red and the blue do not focus at the same spot. 
And, but if you have an achromatic doublet made of two special lenses, you can have it so the red and the blue focus at exactly the same point. So that's how you have these combination lenses that can be very expensive, um, but that's these compound lenses to make it so you can avoid that. Another way, uh, this is one reason why Newton made the reflecting telescope because this, this is due to the dispersion and refraction inside the lens because in a mirror, the light all still focuses at the same point because it's only reflecting off the surface. So red and blue still focus at exactly the same point. You can avoid this thing. So in a mirror, you avoid this. In a lens, unless you have a combination, you're gonna have a problem with that. So that's aberration. Spherical aberration deals with the size of the lens. Uh, chromatic aberration, and that's chromatic aberration deals with the difference of index refraction for the spectrum of visible light. And the way to avoid that is with these aromatic doublets. All right, the last section here, uh, talk about I will talk about um, limits of resolution. Okay. And this deals with the fact of if I have two headlights on a car, say separated by two meters, right? How far away, if I'm a distance away, D, or let's see, let's use L, and this is a separation S, how far away can I be and actually see these as two different lights, or do they end up merging into one? And the idea of that Again, is here's a picture of trying to resolve, all right, all right, two lights separate away. At some point, to get far enough away, there's what we call diffraction, and that limits whether you can actually see, because your eye is a lens. And the limit of this is given by this expression of uh, theta, the angle, is 1.22 lambda over D, where D is the diameter of aperture. And this could be your eye. Uh, it could be a telescope, or whatever it is that's detecting that. So we we'll get into this, and this, and so this is the angle, and this would be the angle theta, which would be approximately s over l. So this is approximately. S over L. This is very far away. So this is the wavelength of light. This will be in meters. Light in meters. Or so these are the same units, I should say. And that's how this is the limit of what we call limit the resolvability. All right, so let's do an example. All right. Yeah. All 
Okay. So, let's use a height of around 600 nanometers, which is 6 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. And for D, we'll use your I is about 3 millimeters, right? The I pupil. So, 3 times 10 to the minus 3rd meters. All right, what's the resolution? How far away? If we have something, um, two car lights that are two meters away, how far away, what would L be the maximum distance we could actually resolve them? If we have perfect conditions. So what we have here is to solve this, we have S over L is 1.22 lambda over d, so it's 1.22 uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 7th over 3 times 10 to the minus 3rd, now that becomes 2, so that's approximately 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4th is s over l. And in that case, L, so that'd be 2 over 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4th <coughs> is L. So that's actually about that's 10, that's 8, 8.8, 8, uh, 8,000 meters. Uh, which is about five miles. So that would be about the limit, the absolute limit where you could actually make out two headlights at a distance of that. Now in reality, if you have, unless, you know, with atmospheric conditions, probably about half that, but that's the limit of what you could make the distance of where it would seem like it's two individual light. Beyond that, it would look like it's just one big light. Closer than that, you start seeing them as two different lights, right? So that's that's an example there. So again, using the I, I which has D is about three millimeters, right? Now let's use something like uh, the Hubble telescope, right? And we're doing it in space, right? That has a D of 2.5 meters, right? So, let's clear this up a little bit. And we'll use the same thing. So for the I, um, we're able to see it about eight kilometers. Let's see what we can do. And that's and that's pushing it because of the problem. All right. So you have the same thing. So it'd be S over L is 1.22 times six times 10 to the minus seventh over 2.5 times 10 to the minus, oh, 10, oh, 2.5, period. All right, so that's going to be, let's see, point, let's see, 12, that's approximately 3. It is S over L. So L would be 2 over 3 times 10 to the minus 7th, which would be about, let's see, 7, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 6th meters, right? So about 6,600 kilometers. That would be across... You know, that would be more than a distance across the United States. 
So the, the Hubble telescope, and this would actually be the case, is up in space. So it actually could resolve two headlights um, from, say, Miami, Florida, looking at a car headlights in Seattle. It could actually distinguish between those two as far as that's concerned. So that's, that's uh, due to the fact it's got a very large mirror. So the larger the mirror, the bigger the resolution, and the smaller the objects you can see far away with visible light. All right, and that's the bigger the telescope. That's why last one here, um, they talk about the Arecibo telescope, um, which unfortunately uh, collapsed last summer. And that has a tel that is a telescope, three hundred meters in diameter, right? Length of three football fields, but it uses radio waves or it used radio waves. So that's the expression here. Uh, S over L, which is theta, is one point two two lambda over d. Or these are both in the same unit. Meters is probably the easiest way to do that. So that is chapter. Um, 25, all right? So that's the last.